The real amortized analysis method is uh, not the accounting or the ones we said last time. So we'll have to do the real one right now. And that is... Um, so just a quick recap. What we're going to do today is called the potential method, which is what's actually being used to do amortization. Um, so what we want is, um, as a setup, uh, it's a sequence of operations, right? An algorithm is a sequence of operations. And with those operations come changes to data structures. I'm going to call these data structures, generally speaking, all the memory collected by the algorithm, arrays, lists, whatever it does, trees, heaps, uh, generally as T. So I'm going to have, uh, this is I, right? So this is 0, let's give it 1. This is operation 1. And the result of operation 1 is T1. T1 is kind of the state uh, of all structures, memories, and everything after operation 1, right? So this is after operation 1. Then I have 2, 3, you know, up to n. This is operation n that implies. So in the case of a stack, T is that array that manages the stack. Right? In the case of a tree, is the tree. In the case of a heap, is the heap. So on and so forth. So this is kind of, um, gen generic speaking, the state of data structures. So here's what we want to do. We also have cost. Right? This is true cost. We said this is C0, this is 0 probably, like we, we don't have nothing for that. C1, C2, up to Cn. That's the true cost in terms of running time. And the running time is, of course, sum of these CIs, right? It's the sum of how many steps does it take to do this. Now, what we said last time is that the amortized, so we have another column here. The amortized cost, we call it, I think, C, uh, CI hat. Right? So it's the C0, C1, up to Cn. So it's our hats. So the amortized cost is the sum of CI hats. This is from i equal 1 to n, and this is from i to 1 to n. And what we said, in order to pay our bills on time, we want, so the fundamental property of amortized analysis is that the sum of CI hats at any point, not just at the final point, but at any point, so um, say to any particular k here, this has to be at least the true sum for any k. So in other words, at, after every number of operations, the real cost is never total real cost. This is true, 
cos this is amortized cost. So at any after any set of operations, the true cost is not bigger than the amortized cost. <coughs> the typical mistake is uh, to say that only has to be true at the very end when I'm done. That's not true. It has to be true after the first operation, after the first two operations, after the three operations. But occasionally, one of these CI hats could be smaller than a CI, right? If I have enough saved from before, at one time when CI is a really big operation, CI hat could be small. So in the case of a stack, if I save up with any push to the stack, one for the pop, when a pop comes, that could be an expensive CI, because pop can take out 20 elements. But because I saved one, one dollar for each element before, for the eventual pop, I don't need a big amortized cost when that big pop comes, because I already have saved up in, in my, in my, in my, um, in my amortized cost before. Okay. That's what we've done. Hands up, who's with me? Good. Now what we want to do here, what is this? We want to define a potential function it has, a, it has a notation, please use this notation. P of the data set data structures. So this P will be on my data structures at, after every operation, will be potential of large costs. You can also call it risk, like how if I have a data structure of high risk, that means I could have a very expensive operation coming up. So for a stack, what's a stack of high risk? One that's full, because if it's full, a pop can, can imply a big operation, right? If I have a small stack, no operation can be dangerous to me, because no operation can take a lot of time. So that's the notion. Um, so some people call, call it potential for large costs. Other people call it risk. Other people call it um, complexity. In a, in a very generic sense, that's not the complexity like the theoretical complexity notion. It's just saying a more complex data structure potentially could allow for more complex operations. If I have a data structure that's just a tree with three nodes, there is no big operation that can come up. But once my tree or heap is very complicated, it is possible to have a very damaging, very costly operation. Okay? So what we want to do now, once we have this uh, potential, we want to, to transform this fundamental property, fundamental amortized analysis property, to say the CI cost, the hat one, has to be at least the CI plus which some people call. So what we want is to show that this property that we need can be obtained with that simple relation. So in other words, if my amortized cost at every operation is at least the true cost plus the difference in potential, how much the data structure has changed from before operation I T I minus 1 is after operation I minus 1, before operation I, and T I is after, after operation I. So this is, this effectively, this whole thing, which is the same as the delta, is what? Change in potential by operation 
So we want to say, I want the amortized cost to be the true cost plus the change in potential. Of course, I say at least that because if I have higher than this, a uh, higher amortized cost will certainly follow my. If, if, if you can do this with amortized cost of say 22222 for stacks, 2.5 will work too, right? Because if some costs are bigger than the cost I need, bigger amortized cost will also work. <coughs> So first of all, before we get into some examples, why what we want to uh, uh, call it this modified? Why is it that this mathematically will imply this? So the first thing we have is a theorem for amortized analysis. It's very simple. That says if CI hat it's bigger than ci plus p of ti minus p of ti minus one. There's another property, I think, two properties that that's just for kitchen purposes. I think phi, this p phi of uh, t zero must be zero and p of any ti must be positive. Uh, I put some question marks because I don't remember them exact. But I think there's some properties like this to be able to start this thing. This potential has to always be positive, and I think the, Z, the empty data structure has to have a zero potential. We, we can check them up later. So what I want to prove here, that if that happens, this is, you can call it a matter of design. Right? I am the one who defines those CI hats. I can put whatever I want in there. CI is not up to me. CI is the true cost of that operation in the algorithm. I don't design the algorithm, so whatever the costs are, that's are the costs. Also, I don't design the data structure. Algorithm uses whatever data structure it wants, like a heap. But I do define the potential myself. So what I want to prove is that I get this property right here, sum of i equal 1 to k of ci hat is bigger than sum of ci i equal 1 to k for any k. So we make the following observation, ci and ti are not our choice. We are the analysis people now. This is up to the algorithm. But ci hat and the function, this is up to us. Us meaning the analysis. We can define the potential and the amortized cost in any way we want without changing the algorithm. Algorithms already fixed in the stack managing algorithm that uses an array to implement the stack. So the algorithm already made the decision what data structure to use and what is the true cost of each stack operation, we can't change that. What we can change is the way we analyze it by defining a potential function and the amortized costs. Good so far? Yes. Uh, question. Yes. Is phi a probability distribution function? No. It's a deterministic function that takes a data structure process a number. And what is the range of numbers? We'll see some examples in a second. Uh, so, yeah, that's a good thing. This potential of change is a number. That's what the phi does. It produces a number. So, this is very easy to prove, right? Think about it. What happens to, the, to this proof? Some of the CI hats, by definition, is bigger than the sum of that, right? So it's bigger than the sum of ci plus p of ti minus p of ti minus 1, right? Because I just, I just say each ci is bigger than that. So now if I open up those sums here, I get what? <coughs> sum of ci separately plus sum of p of ti minus P of ti minus one. Right? This is a telescoping series. 
right? This, if you think about it, it's for i equal 1, is phi of t1 minus phi of t0. Then the next one is phi of t2 minus phi of t1. Then the next one is phi of t3 minus phi of t2, right? So this is phi of t1 minus phi of t0 plus phi of t2 minus phi of t1, da 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 da, up to phi of tk minus phi of tk minus 1. The telescoping is t1, t1, t2, t2, right? So this is the sum of ci plus the last one, p of t k minus I say this quantity is positive because p of t0 is 0, and p of any other t is at least 0. So that's positive. So what did I just prove? That amortized costs as a sum are bigger than the true cost plus something positive. So that gives me my problem. Right? So you can see how if I get this design to work, then I'm guaranteed that my amortized costs are good. That is so far the, the, the idea of the potential. So the actual uh, implementation is to estimate or upper bound the CI true cost I, the, most of the time I know what the true cost is, but sometimes I have to upper bound it. And then to calculate the difference in potential, I'll have to design an intelligent potential function to do that. Depends how, how my data structure works out. But if I do, I add up those things, that's my amortized cost. And it's guaranteed it's going to be a correct amortized cost. right? Because this theorem here says, if you have that property, then it works out. So let's do it for stacks. Right. Here's a stack. Right. It's, say, the level of the stack, that's the top of the stack. This is the max of the stack. This is the top, it's how, how full the stack is right now. So I need a V of this current stack right to define it remember phi is my my design I, I have to choose the phi right mm -hmm. and then I have to also figure out who ci hat is but in practice we don't choose phi I, ci hat we just make it equal with this quantity if we know the ci and we know the difference in potential we're just going to make, the, we want the amortized cost to be as small as possible. So we're just going to say the cost is CI plus that, right? We take the minimum possible here. So we have to decide what is this. And then we're going to take the CI hat equal the true cost of every operation plus P of TI minus P of TI minus 1. The only time we don't take it exact is we don't know this exact, we have to upper bound it, we, we're not sure what it is, so we have to take some upper bound of it. But if we know it exact, we can take it. So what function I need? So what are the operations in the stack? Push uh, and pop, right? What is the true cost? One, and the pop of say k elements, k, k. <laughs> true cost is k. <laughs> so let's evaluate the difference in potential and then the amortized cost, which is we we'll take the ci plus the difference in potential as the amortized cost. We already know from last time what we want our amortized cost to be. I'm cheating here because yeah. uh, we already done it last time. So we would like this to be 2 and 2. Right? So what should be the difference in potential here? One. What should be the difference in potential here? Well, I need to get two. Two minutes. Two minutes. Two minutes. So now it's up to you to figure out how you need an explicit definition of phi. You can't just say this. This is not a definition of phi. Why? Phi has to depend on the actual data structure. 
you can say phi for push is that phi is not a function of the operation. Phi is a function of the data structure. So given a stack, how much is phi? How much is the potential for danger? So what is phi? So this I'm not this is not defining phi numerically, it's defining the difference in phi. Right? So whatever definition we come up with, these values here are not phi, are how much phi changes. So phi is number of elements? Number of elements in the stack. So that would be the top. Right? This top of the stack is how many elements I have in the stack, right? Well, let's see. If I push, how much is phi of the new stack versus phi of the old, old stack? Phi is now the number of elements, so how did that change? It's plus one, right? Okay, but what if I take k elements out? What happened to the top? Goes down to So after push, after pop, k, now it's top minus k. So how much is the difference between the new top, the new number of elements in the stack, minus the old top? So the, the delta in here, so if I do a pop, the delta is one, right? Because I increase by one. If I do a, uh, so that's a push. If I do a pop, the delta is minus k. So I need to fix up this a little bit to make it work. But I think I can do that. So first of all, how is 2 minus k compared to k? Bigger or smaller? Bigger is not a problem theoretically, conceptually. If I use a bigger cost than necessary, right, I'm fine. If I want to use this cost and I have here minus k, what do I get for the amortized pump? I think that's correct too. But keep in mind that running a little bigger functions for both CI and the uh, fee, it's not a problem overall. It's going to maybe give you a li li slightly bigger amortized cost, but that's okay. You need to have CI at least that, right? So having it a little bigger than necessary, it's okay. How about this? Um, so I want you guys to think a little bit more about it. There will be some more questions about stacks later on, uh, not at the amortized analysis. How about on that counter? Remember? I have the counter with log and beats. Here's the counter. Right. So this is uh, the counter at the operation i minus one. <coughs> you guys remember what I'm talking about? I increment one, I add one to it, and this is the counter at the operation i, right? Just have my beats. And um, we want the same, a CI, so this is the binary counter. The true cost of an operation, so what did you say? The true cost is number of hits changed, remember? And we said, in the worst case, you may have to change almost all the bits. That's a situation of one, 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 one. If I, if I do that, I ended up with uh, changing all those bits to zero, right? So at, m at most, hmm, at most log n. But the amortized cost we got before was what?
how much was the amortized cost for this? Two. 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 We did it via brute force calculation there. So now I need a definition of whose fee of di as a potential so that I can write this as ci plus p of ti minus p of ti minus 1. Right? Again, I'm cheating here because I know what I want to do. In reality, we don't have this amortized analysis c hat. But just to get you guys into it, I'm cheating a little bit and saying, okay, can you des design this function thing <laughs> such that this will work out? What should be the fee, the potential, such that whatever bits are changed, when I sum up the true number of bits changed plus the difference in potential, I never get more than two. So this could be anything, right? I can have 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, something like that, right? That could be in there. If I add 1, what's going to happen? 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1. Because I always add 1. Wait, that's the only operation that happens to the binary count. So what do you think P should be? So that I get this number of 1s. In the counter. So I need to prove that this holds, right? Mm -hmm. Here's what I'm gonna say. I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say, let's assume we have a bunch of uh, H ones as a block at the end, mm -hmm. and then a zero. So to prove this, I'm gonna say the last block of one has length Oh, what did I say? H. So there's H once. In this case, H is 4, right? So now I want to figure out how much is CI plus this minus that. So CI, if, if, so this is a before operation I. <coughs> There's always going to be some number of ones at the end, right? Maybe zero. Hmm? Are we following this? Mm -hmm. So then, how many bits are being changed? CI is the number of bits changed from one into zero, plus the number of bits changed from zero into one. Can we go down a little bit with this? No, I don't know if you guys can see this. How many bits are changed from one into zero? <coughs> if I had those fours in here, how many I changed? So that's H of them. How many are changed from zero into one? One. So this is one plus H. Okay, how much is P of Ti? First of all, P of Ti minus 1. How many bits are 1 in there? So let's call the rest of the bits. This is the, the rest. This is H equal 4. How many bits are 1 here? Let's call the number of 1s in the rest of the sequence something else like G. Is the number of 1s not in last block. So in this case, G is... So number of ones in the last block before operation I and G is number of ones 
not in last block. That is after the zero to the left. So there is a last block, there must be a zero, because the, the reason last block ended is because the next one is not a one, right? If this would be a one, the last block would go further. So now I have a zero. All the ones on the left of this zero are this G, right? So that's my G here. In this case, G is three. So how much is potential of T i minus one? There's H once in there plus G. How much is potential of T of Ti? The G's are the same, right? This is still G. And then what happened to all this block? There's one, only one bit that is one, right? So that's G plus one. Okay? So now let's figure out how much is this, this thing here. Then if I have Ci plus P of Ti minus P of Ti minus one, is what? Ci is one plus H, right? And then I get the this minus this. So plus G minus one, right? That's uh, plus G plus one minus P of Ti minus one. So what I've got here is phi of ti is who? G, G, G plus one. Phi of ti minus one is H plus G. So how much is this different? Which means my amortized cost of two from last time is a good one. Because remember the theorem says if you could have this all the time then it's guaranteed that your amortized cost separate. I'm going a little too fast here. Hands up, who's with me? Okay. So potential method means what? An algorithm designed not by us picks a certain data structure to work with and it has some true costs. We can't we have no decision on to what those costs are. It's whatever the algorithm does. We're only doing the analysis. Like I said last time, we're not changing the actual algorithm. But what we can do is define this potential function over that data structure the algorithm has. And calculate the true cost plus the difference in potential. Or upper bounded. If we can't get it exact, we say, OK, it's no more than something and then define our amortized cost as that. And if we do that, we guarantee this amortized cost is correct. Correct as in we pay the bills on time. We never get more costs than what we saved in the account. It doesn't mean it's optimal. I mean, you can still have very high amortized cost if the definition of fee is too bad, too, 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 too big, right? So these are two examples. Both the binary counter and the stacks are two examples. What I'm gonna show you next is some more realistic examples where this comes into play. Uh, this, beyond the basic amortized analysis, which is what is here, and I think one of the exercises in the homework, this is kind of the master level, minimum master level version that you guys are expected to know. What is how do I think of a potential function? The trick in thinking about potential function before you design phi is to think of what? How, how, how do you start thinking about this potential function? From where do you start? Data structure. You look at the data structure. And then you, if you have a guess for the amortized cost, it's easy. You say, OK, I need to get to 2. I can evaluate perhaps for each operation CI or estimate it, and then it tells me what the, the difference should be. The other way to look at this difference, th this is the key of the potential function, is the difference. Okay? So every time you design a potential function, you have to think first about the difference. You can start from the algorithm perspective, because again, in practice, you're not going to know what C hat you want to get. You can think, okay, I'm using a binary search tree. 
I can think about the difference, how much this tree is changing, and try to have a potential that reflects that difference, right? The key of potential functions is how much they reflect the change in potential or the risk. If I were to have potential for a very expensive operation, right? Usually after an expensive operation, the data structure has lower complexity, so the potential of it went down. So let's try to do two examples. Um, I'm going to use some slides because they are too complicated to write on the board. And um, let's see how far we get. This examples is more complicated. It's called Fibonacci hips. That is how do I implement a Fibonacci data structure, a hip to these properties. The whole point of a Fibonacci hip is that it allows the amortized analysis to work, which on average gives me better running time for what are the hip observations, remember? Way in the beginning of the class. Extract mean, hip property, re-hip it, ties, make it work, right? There was a bunch of how much how much time it takes each operation. So there is one operation that will amortize analysis in a Fibonacci hip. Instead of log n, becomes a constant time operation amortized. So in production, when people use a hip for cues or something like that, if it's really large, the difference between constant and log n is, is significant. So Fibonacci hips are used for that. Now, I, uh, during the, all my years teaching this class, I oscillated in the homework between um, between asking you to implement a Fibonacci hip or to implement a binomial hip, which is significantly easier. Currently, the homework says binomial hip. If you really have the time and energy, you should implement a Fibonacci hip instead. Um, yeah, some years I have it with Fibonacci hip and I felt it's too hard, and uh, some years I have it with binomial hips and I felt it's too easy. Yeah. Uh, the book, actually, that's important. I think the book, um, took out the binomial hips chapter, so if you, if you do binomial hips, it's not what we're talking about today. You have to read it from Wikipedia or get the second edition of the book. We are at the third edition. But if you understand Fibonacci hips, binomial hips would not be a problem anyway. Okay? It's, it's, it's okay, so these are my slides here, uh, amortized analysis. Uh, and um, so we already talked about this potential method. There are some slides about that. Let's we'll skip those. First example I want to do before I get to Fibonacci hips is um, I have this list. Uh, so it's a regular linked list. And what I want to do is to read an element, of course. And um, it's called move to front operation. Every time I read an element, I move it in the front of the list for caching purposes. I'm expecting that once I access a value to, to, to need to access that value soon again. It's a typical operation that happens in most registers, you know, in graphics and all that. So um, in a list to find an element, because I'm traversing the list from the head, it's essential to know where that element is. Right, so rank in the list of element is how many things I have to go from the head, how many jumps I have to go through until I get to that element. That's where this rank comes into play. Um, and then I can reorder elements by swapping them. Say that that's my uh, API to, to order things. And I want to say in a sequence of n operations, which are all, all operations are access. Right, so access an element means uh, you, you, you get there. And now it's up to the algorithm to move it to front of the list or not. 
if for any reason the algorithm feels like, okay, I access that element, I want to move it in the front, or I want to move it in the back, or whatever. That's up to the algorithm. What we have in here is a particular algorithm uh, that says move to front. This is an algorithm that you should know when you go to your interview for a list. Every time I access an element, I additionally spend time to swap it out up to where that element stays in front of the list. I don't know if we have an example here. I, I think we do. So if I access D, right? First of all, how do I access it? I start to at the head of the list, and I traverse until I find D. Or maybe I don't find it. If I don't find it, I'm done. I just traverse the list and done. And then I move D to the front of the list. So that means now I'm swapping it to C, right? Then swap it to B, then swap it to A, and I'm done. So if D was ranked four, how many operations were necessary to do the whole thing? Well, it was four to get there, or about four, to access, and another four to move D in the front. So this move to front, roughly the cost of an access will be two times the rank of that rank, meaning the position in the list. That's what I really mean by rank here. Rank is not a matter of sorting. It's a matter of one, two, three, four was in the fourth position. Now that's my algorithm. And you should know this algorithm again. When you go to the interview, you might need to know how move to front works, which is very simple. Now, she here has a different algorithm that says, I'm going to do something else. I'm going to access is mandatory. If I'm asking for an object, you have to produce it. But then her algorithm does not necessarily move all things to the front. It does something else. And that algorithm turns out to be optimal. That is, how do I measure optimality? If I access many, many things, I access a million things. I measure my running time, that is access and move to the front, versus her running time, which is access and do whatever she wants after. This is a little bit like in dynamic programming where we said, suppose we have a solution. How do we look at it? That's the same kind of mechanism we do here. Suppose this is my algorithm. I don't know if it's optimal, right? Because optimality has to do with the total number of operations within many, at this end, how many of access I can be very large. So I have an algorithm, move to front. And she has the optimal algorithm, which is long term, when n is large, her algorithm does the best thing. I mean, I have no guarantee that, that moving things in the front of the list is a good thing. I'm guessing it's a good thing, but I don't know. So the amortized analysis in this example is used to prove something theoretical. That is, that no matter what her algorithm, the optimal algorithm does, this is not significantly worse. So it may not be as good as the optimal, but is okay compared to the optimal, which we don't even know what the optimal does. That's where we're going to use amortized analysis to prove that no matter what the optimal algorithm does, which we don't know, this is a reasonable compromise to the optimal. Make sense what I want to do here? So remember, I don't know what that algorithm is and what it does. I just know it's the best thing you can do if n is a million. So, Move to front, as I said, move things in the front of the list. What we're going to prove is that the running time between my algorithm, which is move to front, and the optimal algorithm is a constant of four, which if you recall asymptotic bounds, a constant in terms of a bound means the same asymptote. If that is an n log n algorithm, this is also an n log n algorithm because you just multiply by four. It's not worse 
by four times more operations. Now, you could say in, in production, four times is significant thing. If that takes a million or three million steps, this will take 12 million steps. But at least asymptotically, it's not n squared versus n log n. It's just a constant factor bigger. And the constant is four. So how do we do this? This is my algorithm. Move to front. This is my cost, total cost. And that is her algorithm, which is optimal, which I don't know. And that's her cost. What I want to say is my cost is not worse than four times the optimal cost. We're going to see this notion when we study approximation algorithms towards the end. That we can't get to an optimal solution that's too high, but we get to a reasonable solution that's not too far worse from the optimal. We could do the same in terms of dynamic programming, but what we studied, our dynamic programming, was always getting the optimal solution. We never worried about the solution that's not optimal. So uh, there's list Li, which is uh, Li, the, every algorithm, either mine or hers, can change the list in some way. Mine decides to put the element axis in the front. Li will be the data structure, the list, after the i operation by my algorithm, MTF, move to front. And I think Li star will be the optimal. Everything would start relates to the optimal algorithm, which I don't know. So Li star would be the list after i operations in her algorithm. Ci star is the optimal cost of the optimal algorithm for the operation i. So for me, the cost, like I said, is twice the rank. Why is twice the rank of the position? Wants to access it, and another wants to move it. For her, for the optimal algorithm, it's going to be the rank or whatever that x is. So it's not in my list. It's in her list. See the start here? Because she has to access it. In a list, the only way to access things is to just traverse the list up to, up to that point. There's no other way. And then there's magic. She does something in the optimal algorithm, which I don't know. It's, it's the I. Some swaps, presumably, to move the elements around. Right? <coughs> so TI is the number of swaps this magic optimal algorithm does, which we don't know what they are. So here's our, our potential function. <coughs> of course, we don't have access to Li star. We don't know how this list looks after three operations or after five operations in the optimal algorithm. We only know how it looks in our algorithm. So what we're going to say is the number of inversions in the list um, is how many things are inverted between my list after I <coughs> operations and her list after I operations. Okay, so this is her list, for example. This is my list. An inversion is when I have things in a certain order and she has it in the opposite order. For example, EA versus EA, right? That, that's an inversion because in this one, E comes before A and in this other one, A comes before E. So first of all, do we have the same elements in our list? Yes. We do. We, we don't change the content of the list. Every time we access an element, we don't delete it or anything like that. What we are allowed to do after the access is to do some swaps. And I chose to do move to front swaps. If I access an element, that moves to front. She may have chosen to do who knows what, right? I don't know. That's the optimal algorithm. Why is it that in the analysis, I kind of put my hands on this Li. So, so in the, the amortized analysis here, clearly the definition of the potential function needs access to the Li, right? I couldn't define the number of inversions if I don't have Li stuck, right? To look at inversions, you have to compare a pair of elements from the my list, the move to front list, to the same pair in the optimal list the optimal algorithm list after that many operations. So this is after we did, say, i equal 20 access. Why is it that we don't know what Li star does 
yet in the analysis we can define this. So this is the same like dynamic problem when we say suppose somebody gives me the optimal solution. It doesn't mean I have it, it doesn't mean I can obtain it. What it means is if somebody were to give it to me, I can analyze it. So this analysis, remember, doesn't change anything with the algorithm. My algorithm is still moved to front. It moves objects to the front. I'm not changing the algorithm. I'm not changing the costs of the operations. All I'm changing is a theoretical framework of how do I measure that algorithm. So in that theoretical framework, I can assume I have LI star. The algorithm moved to front does not have LI star when I program it, right? But in terms of pure mathematics here, on paper, I can think about her list, whatever that might be. There's a difference between assuming you have concretely the solution or the optimal algorithm for a problem in practice, in, in, a, in an implementation, which is now what we have here, and mathematically doing some analysis based on what the optimal solution might be. It doesn't mean the algorithm has access to it, just the analysis have access to it. This is a subtle point that is the same point in we have the dynamic programming. When we analyze that optimal solution and we make those inferences and we define the recurrence based on it, it's not like we have the optimal solution. We just say what could happen if we have it so we know how to define the recurrence. It's the same thing in here, right? If I have her optimal list after I operations, I measure how many uh, inversions I have here. It's EC an inversion? Yes. Yes. How about EA? Yes. ED? Yes. EB? Yes. DB? Yes. That's it or there's more? Inversion means in one list is one way, in the other list is the other way. But I don't think I have more. That's all the pairs inverted. And remember, my, my potential function is twice that number. So if I have five inversions, the potential will be? Okay. okay. So now, um, <coughs> is delta Li always positive? Number of in twice the number of inversions is a positive number, right? Because the inversions are zero or higher. If the list is empty, I have zero inversions. Okay. Um, or, or I have at least the same list. If I start with some list, both algorithms start with the same list. There's no inversion between them. So zero times two is zero. So how much does it change um, if I do a swap? It's either if I swap something in one list, if those are consecutive elements, right, then I swap. If that was an inversion before, it's not an inversion anymore. And if it uh, was an inversion, if it's not an inversion, now it is an inversion. And why is it not plus minus one, it's plus minus two? Is what? We multiply by two. We multiply by two number of inversions. Good. So now, let's look at operation I. How operation I works. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm again, in analysis, I'm, I'm looking at both lists. Li, that's my list. Uh, or I have actually Li minus one, that's before the operation I. And I have L star minus one, that's her list, the optimal list, after uh, I minus one operations, before the I operation. So I'm going to say, I'm going to think of this Li minus 1 and Li minus 1 star. Both of them has the axis element, right? It may not be in the same rank. So my element is here, and my element, my her element is there, right? Now, uh, ignore this part in here. I'm going to say it in words easier to figure out. A, it's all the elements that in both lists are before x. Okay. So whatever elements are in here before x, and in this list also before x, that's A. D is all <coughs> elements that in both lists are after x. 
So that's easy, A and B. Who is B? B are all the elements that in my list are before X, but in the optimal list are after X. And who is C? The ones that in my list are after X, and in the optimal list are before X. So that's A, B, C, D. So now what happens when I access how many steps, what's my rank, how many steps I need to go to get to X? A union B, right? The sum of A plus B. But in the optimal algorithm is A plus C. Okay. Um, all right. So the rank um, in me, for me is the rank of X would be A union B, right? Or A plus B, how many elements are A and B. For the optimal algorithm will be uh, A union C, right? So that's what's written here. My rank is A plus B plus one, one being X, I need to access X. And this is A plus C plus one, because I need to access X. So what happens when I move to the front? I move X to the front, uh, how, that of course takes the rank R steps to move to the front. But what happens to the inversions? If I move this X to the front, what, how do I compare, I want to compare the inversions between this list and that list. So X moved in here, it got, in, it got jumped over all the A and Bs. What inversions were not inversions before, but now they are inversions? With A. A, X was in the same position with A in both lists, but now it jumped over all A elements. A versus X, it's an inversion now between the lists. However, there were some that were there and now were not there. That's the B, right? B were inversions before, because B was before and the other list was after. But when I jump X before A and B, now X, B, are in the same position like the optimal list. So what we are saying here is that uh, we create, create new A inversions because every element in A is now an inversion, but destroys B inversions. So the change of potential, this two is because we multiply by two the number of inversions. We created A new inversions we deleted B inversions. But also, this list might do T, TI swaps, this TI that we don't know what it does after. So we say, by TI swaps, you can create at most TI inversions. So this is an upper bound because we don't know what TI does. We say, at most, you create a new delete B that were there, and the TI, in the worst case, additionally creates new TIs. It may not be exactly TI, because if you place with these elements any further, it may be that it actually deletes some inversions, but in the worst case, TI adds TI more inversions to it. So my difference in potential is not more than that. Okay? So now let's calculate the amortized cost right, of NTF. <coughs> So this is a theoretical analysis that calculates the amortized cost of move to front algorithm. That's the formula we've seen before, right? So where is 2R coming from? Two I, 2R is CI, no? What's the true cost? So rank, right? Because I did one rank to access it and one rank to do the swaps to move it to the front. So the cost is 2R. And this is what we had on the previous slide. We say the maximum difference in potential is I may create A inversions, delete B inversions, and the TI, whatever the algorithm, optimal algorithm does after the access, may create at most new TI inversions. Okay, a little bit of arithmetics. Why is this equal to that? 2R is 2R, right? Uh, A is A, right? DI is DI. 
I replace minus is minus. I replace the B with R minus 1 minus A. Can I do that? Yes, because B is R minus A minus 1, right? This is the pure substitution in that. Okay? 2R is 2R. Why do I get 4A? I have 2A is here times 2. 2R is coming from where? 2R, right? Plus 2, it's minus minus 1 times 2. And plus 2 Ti. I say this is 4A plus 2 plus 2 Ti. Because 2R goes away with 2R. Yes? No? Hands up? And I say this is smaller than 4 times R star plus Ti. that is. So who's R star? A plus C plus 1. Is that correct? Let's go back and look. So R star is what? The rank of the X element in the optimal list, right? So let's look back at those lists. The rank of X here is A plus C plus 1. So if I have a plus c plus 1 or a plus 1 in there, if I put r star, right, I get 4a, that's going to cover the 4a, 4 times 1 is going to cover the 2, and 4ti is bigger than 2ti, right? So this is bigger than that. I say that's pretty much over now, because this in here, is the cost of the optimal algorithm, right? It does R star to access the rank plus TI operations to do whatever it does after. I don't know what it does. So what I just proved that, I mean, there's another uh, bunch of equations, but you can already see that I have an amortized cost that is at most four times the true cost and it's guaranteed to work as an amortized cost. Why is it guaranteed? There is a theorem, right, that said what? If the CI is at least the true cost plus the difference in potential, whatever potential you have defined, there were some simple conditions that the potential must satisfy, and it does then the theorem said this is a good amortized cost. You can use it in your analysis, and the total of this cost is a reasonable upper bound for you what your algorithm does. And that upper bound is what I want to prove, is not bigger than four times the true cost of the algorithm. So that is, is of course, uh, I can sum those things up with a theorem and I get the answer. But this is nothing, I mean, this is just reiterating the theorem. This is the part that proves the amortized cost I'm using. It's, so the theorem says this amortized cost is good or valid, meaning it's at least the true cost for any sequence of operations, not just at the end, right? So clearly this is a cost and upper bound if I pay this amount, it's covering the running time of the algorithm. On the other hand, it's not worse than four times this optimal algorithm. So that proves that my algorithm move to front is not worse than four times. It's four, it could be longer than the two, optimal algorithm by for constant of four, but not worse than that. Yes? Uh, does the does the cost of performing operations in finding the P uh, matter in this case? Because we'll have to find the number of inversions, right? Uh, finding the number of inversion is not part of the algorithm. It's part of the analysis. Okay. So you have to, in the amortized analysis, the easy way to understand this, if you haven't seen it before, is to totally separate the algorithm with the analysis. 
So the cost, the running time cost, the algorithm doesn't find the number of inversions. The algorithm doesn't have access to LI stars. The algorithm, what it does, looks for X and then swap it all the way to the front of the list. That's what the algorithm does. He doesn't know, the algorithm doesn't know about optimal lists, about amortized analysis, nothing. The algorithm is very simple. I bet you can implement it in 20 minutes, right? Right? Just find the X and then swap it to the front. That's it. The algorithm, the analysis, it measures the number of inversions and it does a theoretical. This is the analysis that says, okay, on paper, that's not running in a, in a computer algorithm. This is not using a computer to compute the number of inversions. It's all mathematics. It's theoretical on paper. The analysis says, if you define the amortized cost that way, which is up to us, remember? How did we define the fee? Number of inversions between my algorithm move to front and the optimal algorithm, which we don't know what it is, but let's assume there is one, right? Or some other random algorithm. This optimal could be any algorithm that does find the X and then does TI operations after that, whatever the operations are. So the optimal algorithm has to find X because that's necessary. It's mandatory to find X. And then you can do TI operations of whatever kind. You can swap uh, any things in the list. This is on paper. So we're not using a computer at all. There is no running time here. This is just pure calculations, right? On paper, we say this running time, the way we measure our MTF algorithm, is not four times worse than any other algorithm who finds X and then does a bunch of swaps. Can I set TI equals zero? Can I say my algorithm finds X, does nothing else, the optimal algorithm? Can I do that? Can I say her algorithm is finds the X, don't do nothing after that. TI equals zero, I don't do anything. Yeah. This is again on paper. It does not require me to go to my algorithm, move to front implementation, and change anything in it. Because we don't have access to whatever algorithm or list somebody else does. So the easiest thing, again, for amortized analysis is to totally disconnect the algorithm, which in many cases is the same algorithm you have seen before. If, if you did more programming when you were in high school, some of you may have done an exercise like this. After access an element in a list, move it to the front of the list. But perhaps the move was not to swaps, was a direct move. Because in a list, I can take the element, put it in the front, and just redo the pointers, right? Yes. It's a very simple exercise. Move to front algorithms. A lot of the computer operations are cached that way. Whatever access gets to the front of the cache. The different part here is the analysis that's very different from before. Because we come up with those CI hats costs, which are the true <coughs> cost plus some change in the data structure. And the, the, the analysis is pure mathematics. It doesn't change in any way. And I know I'm repeating myself, but I, the, I, I'm not changing the way the, the move to front algorithm works. Only the way I measure its running time. And here I'm not even measuring its running time. All, what, anything I'm doing is I'm proving that my running time is not worse than four times of any other algorithm that access X, right? including the optimal one. Because any other algorithm will use R star plus TI operations. TI is up to that other algorithm to do whatever they want. But my algorithm will be at most four times that running time. So if the runtime of the optimal algorithm is 50 million steps, my will not be worse than 50 million times for 200 million steps. Asymptotically, it's good because this is just a constant in front of the last Yes, there was a question. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so can we say that we use amortized analysis only when the most optimum solution cannot be achieved? In here, we say we compare our algorithm. So again, the algorithm is fixed. It's moved to front. We, we, amortized analysis doesn't change the algorithm. So we have an algorithm moved to front. We know it's not optimal all the time, because it's not always optimal to move the element back in the front. 
perhaps what you're saying is if I knew this is the best thing you can do in a greedy sense, I wouldn't need to analyze it because it's the best thing you can do. Right. Maybe. But the amortized analysis is not concerned with changing the algorithm. It's saying, think of a running time in a different way. The algorithm is the same. But now in here, instead of calculating the running time, we're proving with amortized analysis that the runtime is at most a constant for times whatever the optimal algorithm does. So for production purposes, there are two questions. One, how close are you to the optimal algorithm? If I implement move to front, which is by the way implemented in many caching systems, how optimal is that? That could easily be an interview question. If I have a list and move to front, is that optimal? And if it's not optimal, how far away is from the optimal? They wouldn't ask you to for the fork, but they would expect a good answer would be to know that it's in a constant times the optimal, whatever the optimal is. So that's one question. If I have an algorithm, how close is to the best I could have done? The other question which is practical for production is, okay, but even the optimal, how fast is that? If I'm implementing the cache system, this is saying you're not too far from the optimal, but is the optimal a reasonable thing to do? That's a different production issue, that e e even if I get the optimal algorithm possible, maybe that's too slow. So I can't do what I want in, in say, a Google runtime environment because people ask queries and they get the results right away. So those are two different questions. In here, we're only saying, if this is really one want to achieve the optimum access, this algorithm is not too bad compared to the optimal algorithm. Yes? Uh, so you first have a definition of the fee, and then you can do all the analysis. But there are a lot of other fee that you can choose. So how do you choose a fee? Yeah, I, I mean, it's, it just seems like a uh, design. Yeah, and, and then it works. But how can I know if right? So the homework will ask you to do a bunch of those <laughs> design things, right? Uh, as I said, this topic as full is a PhD scope topic. We're not going to expect a master student to be able to design fee out of the blue. In here, this example, you need to be quite creative, right? Who would have thought to look at the optimal algorithm list and to pick the fee? the number of inversions between the list times two. <laughs> right? That's a smart guy who figured this out. It's, it's not a random guy. Um, and I'll show you another one in a second, right? So, but for now, while we can't offer a general recipe, we say if you have an idea of what you amortize cost one to be, you take the difference between that and CI, and that's the difference in potential. If you don't, the other route is to look at the data structure and figure out how much it changes from one operation to the other. For some data structures, this is easy. So take a stack. If I do a push, how much it changes? One element, right? If I do a pop, how much it changes? Okay, element. So I can kind of right there decide how much my data structure has changed. That's an intuition, okay? We can't offer a recipe in general. If I have the binary counter, Somebody figure out right away what is the, the change in potential. Is the number of ones in the counter that matter? Right? That's the potential of change. The more ones I have, the more danger I have for a possible operation that takes a lot of expense. Yes? So uh, when, when we are dealing with dynamic programming, we come up with a solution and we walk toward that solution. That this is the optimal solution and we try to achieve it. Right, you say that's the optimal solution. How, right. do, how does it work? It has this property. Let me define my recurrence in terms of that property. Exactly. But in this case, we are assuming that there is an optimal solution. And in this right. particular problem, move to front? Uh, yeah. Or in amortized analysis. In, in, amortized analysis. in amortized analysis, in general, we don't take a look at the optimal solution. This is just for this particular problem. In this move to front, we use amortized analysis not to evaluate the running time. We use amortized analysis to analyze the running time versus the optimal running time. But in many problems, we're just going to compute the running time based on the amortized analysis. The other example we have is the ones you have in the meter. Remember that problem too? That says find the most recent 
which is not smaller, it's equal or higher. Last time I gave you a hint of how to do that. You say for each element, you keep track of the pointers, but the problem is every time you have to go back, you can run through a bunch of pointers, right? So you can't say it's linear time because you clearly have to do it for each element. That's linear, but then each element has to do a constant number of operations. So how do you show that when you jump over those pointers to go back, that's linear? With amortized analysis, it's easy because you say for each element in my array, one unit for processing it like seeing it, and one unit <coughs> for jumping over it with some bunch of pointers back. And what we have to prove then is that that one saved, I only need to use it once, right? Because if I only save one dollar and I need it more than once, that's a problem. But I can show in that problem that every time I'm jumping over an element, no other further element will need to jump over it. So I only need to use the save dollar once. How about difference of potential for that problem? So I have, I'm not gonna do this right now, but that's a question for you guys. The way I did it was kind of with the accounting method before, but now I'm saying you have that array and what happens every time you see a new element, you have to look back to the pointers to see what's the most recent equal or higher. So what's the fee of that data structure, including the pointers that I have defined, so that the difference in potential has this property, right? The true cost might be going through a bunch of pointers back to find the most recent valid maximum. That's the I, how many things I go back. And I need to say the amortized cost, we say already, I give you a hint what the amortized cost is, right? What was it? Two. So I need a difference of potential that when I add it with the true cost, gives me two. If I want to use the potential method for that problem. So I'm, I want to talk about the meter problems more, not in class at office hours. So I want to talk about this problem, the number two. I want to talk about problem number four, the part B. And problem number six. I don't think anybody completely solved six yet. I think some people did it in N square with dynamic programming. That's okay, it's a valid solution, but it's not optimal. The optimal solution is not N square for the supervisors. So can we get an N log N full complete solution for that problem? I'm not talking about the grades. The grades are what they are, but I'm talking for your benefit to know how to pick those supervisors. Once you sort them, you want to pick them in linear time. She is interested in that. So I think we had some discussions already. Anyway. Uh, I want to move, yes. Uh, there was another question regarding this. Yeah. Uh, in this, uh, in the optimal algorithm, we assume that like it was obvious that we will need uh, to access for the to access that element, we need to perform uh, the rank of that operation and number of operation uh, number of operations. But in some operations, uh, in some cases, there may be algorithms which don't even need to access that. Uh, no, that's mandatory. In this problem, it's mandatory for every operation. They give you an X to access it first, and then you can do a bunch of things after that, like move it to front or not move it or swap a few things or rearrange the list but the accessing that element is required. So the question is, I want to access the element and then I'm allowing you to do a reorganization of the list with swaps uh, to make it easier for the next operations. And we decide and move to front and our optimal algorithm can decide whatever else to do after the access. Can we move on? So we can implement those hips because your homework nominally is due when? Friday. Friday? Yeah, you're not going to finish by Friday. Because <laughs> <laughs> today is Tuesday. But maybe you finish by Monday. Right. So cold weekend, cold weather, nothing to do. So you can do your homework. Uh, there are three problems that require demos. You're not going to get the grade until you show it live running to a TA. TAs will announce which one of them 
does because they uh, task each one of them with one of the problems. So somebody will do the hashes demo, somebody will do all the red black trees demo, and somebody will do the heaps demo. So you have to find that EA and demo the problem. Uh, I think they'll announce some office hours because there's no grading at home. They will spend more time at office hours. How about uh, Fibonacci? So we don't need to do this in, in, in detail. Uh, the reason being, you're not gonna implement Fibonacci hips. You implement the binomial. But some of you might implement Fibonacci hips. Um, this is a practical issue. It's gonna sound extremely theoretical. I mean, at the end of this lecture, in 16 minutes, you're gonna be like, who the heck would ever use this? <laughs> I, I feel like that. It's actually being used in Dijkstra algorithm, which is a very popular algorithm. We're gonna talk about it in two weeks from now. A lot of things that require skews and that large production systems will benefit from a data structure like this because it's more efficient than the heaps we've seen before. Okay. So while this is gonna be just an intuition of how it works, the details, you need more details from the book to implement it. Some of you will choose to implement binomial heaps which are easier but if you want to do this, we'll have to talk more about it. So what do we want? We want a collection of heaps. So remember the heaps, they have a certain property that is what? Children are, I think this is backwards in here, children are bigger, but that's the same thing. You can do it with smaller. And instead of extracting, uh, we extracting mean, I think, Right? Um, so the idea is we have a, a bunch of uh, heaps and they are connected with the link list at the top. Right? So imagine these are my heaps of different sizes and there is a link list that connects the roots of them. Uh, there's a slight difference between Fibonacci heaps and binomial heaps, which it's not essential right now. That is when do they reorganize the structure? The binomial heaps, that's the sim simple version, is when you reorganize as soon as you need to. That's similar to red-black trees. How many people implement the red-black trees? Okay, so when you do the deletion, you have to reorganize the tree immediately to satisfy the red-black property. Kind of that <coughs> will happen with the binomial heap. Although it doesn't have the black node. So Fibonacci heaps have the black nodes, and it can delay the reorganization of the heap. Um, so here's how it might look, right? I have these heaps, and again, the property is that a number is smaller than its uh, children, and there is a link list at the, at the root. Um, so this is conceptual, this is not part of the structure, it's just saying I have a bunch of Um, I have to maintain the minimum element. I need to know which one of those roots is the minimum. That's easy. And I have, like in red black trees, a bunch of mark nodes. The mark nodes in here, like in red black trees, control some notion of complexity. In red black trees, what was the purpose of marking black nodes? Control the balance, right? Not let the tree go all the way down in one thing. In here, I need to control the complexity of the data structure, that feed. And there is a definition for it, but if I tell you, you won't remember it. A node is black if it's the child of somebody and each child has been removed. So when do I make a node black? This node, for example, right here, the 46, it's white. If it has a children that's being removed, 46 become black because it's the child of someone, it's not a root, and I just remove one of these children. That's the notion of black, but it doesn't matter for now. I have some black nodes that are marked. Okay, so um, there's a bunch of notations. T is the number of trees, M is the number of marked nodes, D is how deep each tree can be, max the depth of the, of the, of the hip, right? 
Um, so in here, we have minimum is a three in this example. N is 14, that's the total number of nodes. Is that correct? How many nodes are here? Six, seven, eight, 12, 14, right, that's right. T of H is five, who's T? Number of hips or trees, so that's five. And who is M? Number of mark nodes, three. So what do I want to do with this thing? I want to define a potential function, which like has been suggested is total magic. <laughs> is the number of trees plus twice the number of black nodes. Nice, who could come up with that, right? No, these were, these were premier researchers that won all kinds of awards and stuff for coming up with this. So if you thought this is difficult, it requires creativity, it is, because those people made a career by defining people <laughs> and using them. No, and actually, that was, that, that again, this is not just a theoretical exercise, it's actually used in practice. So by coming up with it and proving everything that has been proved about it, that was a big deal. So what do I want to do with it? Say I want to insert an element, how do I do that? Well, I put it there in the list, right? So I made, instead of five trees, you know, I have six. And what's the difference in potential for doing so? Remember what my potential is? Number of trees plus twice number of black nodes. So how much the potential has, has changed? One. One. There is some math in terms of what the amortized cost, but I don't, I don't want to focus on the CI hats right now. Just to understand the delta in potential is the part that's tricky. So the, what happened? I didn't color anything black. I just added a thing. The difference in potential is one because I only changed the number of things. Easy, right? What happens if I extract the minimum? So first of all, is that still valid? It's still valid, right? Bunch of hips. What happens if I extract the minimum? That's the minimum. But if I take this out, this is not, I need to do something here, right? So if I take this out, um, oh, sorry, that's a different thing. Linking operation. Um, so linking, I don't know why it's out of order maybe. Linking refers to taking this whole tree and making it, so this is a kind of a tool, like we have the red black trees, the rotations, mm -hmm. and here we say if you have those two things, by linking we mean we take the tree, remains a minimum, and we add the 15 as a uh, root in there, right? So instead of having two hips, this creates one hip out of both of them. And is it going to be valid if I add this 15 as a root here? Is the mean, mean hip property stays? Yes. Yes, yes or no? Yes. Yes. This had the mean hip property and 15 is bigger than 3. I think that's going to be a valid hip when I combine them. Right? And combining, if I use the right pointers, it's relatively easy. So how do I do extract me? I want to take this tree out. <coughs> so I'm going to have to first thing put the children, the, the remaining hips, into the main list. Okay. So that's what's going to happen if I take the mean out. I put this here. But then I want to consolidate. I want to do that which binomial hips try to do right away. In here, it's done only after the extract mean. So consolidate, it's a little challenging operation. How do I consolidate? I'm looking for the degree of these trees because I'm gonna allow only hips that have a certain shape. So my hips will be, this is shape degree zero, meaning no children. Degree one will be one child. Degree two will have to be a one and a two Degree three will be what? A one, a two, and a four. It will be the degree three. Whenever I have degree three, 
will be a structure that has this is this is not going to happen in my Fibonacci heaps because I'm never going to have two two subtrees of the same shape. For efficiency purposes, it's managed that way. So when I have degree three, I'm going to have one of one, one of two, and the third one will be of four. So here's what how it's going on. I say I found there a degree what. Degree one. The reason it's pointing to this one is that it's a degree one three. I keep going. That's a degree two. two. This is a degree zero. zero. This is a degree zero. zero. Link it with the other degree zero. If I have two degree zeros, I can link it. How do I link it? Put the twenty-three under seventeen, right? Now I have two degrees. One. Can I link them? Yes. Who goes under who? Seventeen goes under seven, right? Because I have two degrees one, meaning two hips of size root plus a child. I'm not gonna let two of them to be occurring here. I'm gonna say if I have two of those, so I need this catalog to manage that, right? I need a catalog that says you your current merging run into the same degree as an existing one. So this is the existing one. This one, because I never have more than one of that degree, this catalog will tell me, if you have degree one, how do I found the other tree that has degree one? I go into my catalog, and my catalog says, this is the one. So I'm not running additional running time here, because by keeping the this at degree one, this at degree two, once I parse them, I already know in constant time if this is a degree what, what, no, one. I know if I have in my catalog another tree of degree one. Either I don't have one, or if I have, it's exactly one. So I could go to that one immediately, and linking will be all of one operation, right? Because linking two trees, it's all of one. So I'm gonna link those two, and I now I've got a Degree two. I look at my catalog, do I have a degree two three? Yes. yes. And the catalog points me exactly in memory where that is. I don't have to search for it. Mm -hmm. So if I have another degree two, I'm gonna keep doing this. So now I have a degree three, and that stays as the degree three one. If there's another degree three, it'll be combined into a degree four. And that's the merging part. That's not the hardest part. So I have another two here. Two will be stored as two because there is no two, right? That's why I'm storing those two as one, sorry, because there's no one. This one got merged before into other things. But later on, I see another one, and I already have a one, so I'm going to combine them into a two. If there will be another two, this will be further combined into a three, and then further combined with the existing three. I always have, for every degree, only one heaps of that size for efficiency purposes. How many people are with me? Okay, you guys can go ahead and clarify. <laughs> <laughs> right? All right. Here's some analysis. What happens to the difference in potential, right? So if I do all that consolidation, how the potential has changed? Hmm. Potential has to do with the depth. I think D is the is it the I forgot, is it the depth or the degree? Maximum degree. So D is the maximum degree. Um, I don't think we have a depth in here. I thought that it's related to depth, but it's just here. But, but you can see that in the way the consolidation work here, the, the depth is very related to the degree, right? Because if I have a degree three, the depth must be three. The way I'm managing this, a uh, depth, then if I have a degree uh, two, the depth must be 
two. So that's why I was, I think depth and degree happen to be the same exact number in those pieces. So how does this work? I have a bunch of things to do for each stage of my algorithm, right? Um, so the change in potential listed here, first of all, did I change any black notes? No. No. I didn't change the black notes, right? Do you remember changing any black notes? No. So that stays the same. What did I change? Number of trees. Number of trees. So this has to do with how many trees are being changed. And that has to do with the degree of these trees, because this, this merging operation has the potential to change the degrees, right? I have a global maximum degree, which is log n. Uh, we may need to look at this later on to figure out this. It's too much calculations here to do it right now. But this is where, this is, I'm going to show you at the end why this is important. But I'm not done. There's another operation that's necessary in the heaps, which is decrease key, right? Or increase key if I do the maximum. Well, in a degree screen is the difficult part. That's where I'm going to have to recolor some nodes. Um, so there is an easy case. If I decrease a key, what's the easy case when I don't have to do nothing? If I decrease this 29 to 27, do I have to change something? About 25. When it's becoming a problem? <laughs> when it's less than 24 because it doesn't maintain the property. So like in red-black trees, I'm going to do the decrease, but then I have to deal with the fact that this is not maintaining the heap property. So how do I do that? So suppose um, I have a 46. If I decrease it to, what did I say, to 29, that's fine. I don't have to change nothing. But if I decrease it to 15, I break the property here with the parent. So what do I do? Cut the subtree from there and put it back into main list. Also, if the parent was the child of somebody and was not uh, colored black, I make the parent black now. Because that, that is a potential problem for me in the fee function. So what then next? This is now a bunch of cases that have to do with the, the, if you implement red black tree deletion, there's a bunch of cases here of what could happen. So in this case, this five, the, the, the parent is already black, right? And the parent of the parent is already black. So I was here. Um, I hear you. I mark the parent, right? And now I decrease this one. This is black. I have to put the five in there, right? So again, I cut the five, I put it on the main list. If I have black, black at this parent, I have to cut this part too. And then I so what happened here? I cut, I further cut the blacks into the main list, and I do not color the parents. So the, the sorry, the main roots never get colored black. <coughs> now, this is easy to follow. I'm sure if you implement a binomial heap, you can make it into Fibonacci heaps. The algorithm part is very easy, right? Because Cutting by those roots, it's, I think, even easier than the red black trees, right? If you see the pattern black, keep cutting it. If you see further black, keep cutting it until you hit the root, you don't cut it. Easy, right? The hard part here is not to take a binomial heap and implement a Fibonacci heap. 
the hard part is to follow this analysis, what happens when you cut those trees. So I'm going to talk about this analysis a little further. I think the analysis has theoretical purposes for you guys in practice. You may want to implement a Fibonacci heap instead. What do we get if we implement Fibonacci heaps? First of all, the union of two heaps is much easier than in binomial heaps. Because in union, we have two link lists. How do we join two link lists? We just break two pointers. And then, which one is the global minimum? We look at this minimum here and the minimum here. Minimum between them. How long is it going to take to join two Fibonacci heaps? Go of one, right? And here's why we want to do this. If we implement a Fibonacci heap as opposed to a binomial heap, or as opposed to the heap like we did in in the class before. The only operations that will be log n time, it's extract mean and delete. Everything else runs in constant time. This is amortized cost. That's why large production systems who need queues, for example, implement queues even with Fibonacci queues. So we'll have to get to the analysis in more detail. This is also done in the book. As I said, it's a PhD level material, so I won't insist on it. This amortized analysis of Fibonacci heaps won't be in the exams. Okay? So I can tell you right now, the final exam may have an amortized analysis problem, but it won't be amortized analysis for Fibonacci heaps. All righty. The homework I expect to be due on Monday. In fact, what we're going to do, we're going to say everything except the Fibonacci heap is due on Friday on paper. But the Fibonacci heap implementation, you can demo it next week. And if you have it done when you demo, it won't matter if it's Friday or whatever. Next week. Okay.